right, again, it seems like we're going slow, but we'll pick it up a little bit. If you look, notice here on the middle part of page 8, database-driven arrays. It says, if you think about it, most database queries return a multidimensional array. Isn't that the truth? When you look at what's right here, this is a big array, and each record that's inside of it is an array. And that's what they're talking about. All right? And it says, uh, however, if you need to do something more elaborate with the results, then you'll need to find a way to do something more like this. I mean, printing it out the way they show it like this, this is just plain ugly. This is at least something that you can work with, look at it, and it'll make a little bit more sense. All right. So this is what they have you working on for the rest of the chapter. Okay? And it's the same thing that they showed at the beginning of the chapter. It may not look like it, but I'm going to back up for a second and show you this. This, right there. Remember this thing? Must do this. Another task, subtask, etc. What this is right here is this is a task. Makes sense, right? That's a task. And it's numbered. This is another task. All right? This is another task, and the parent of this task is that task. Does that all make sense? It's kind of like writing an outline. All right. So this must do this has no parent. Another task has no parent. Subtask 1 and subtask 2 have parents, the same parent, which is another task, and subtask 3. Sub subtask 1 is a child of subtask 2. Does all that make sense? And that's what they're saying here is they're saying that if you go and create that, it kind of looks like this when you start working with it. It looks really weird to take a look at, but it'll make some sense well, once we start doing it. So they had you create that table. We already did this. So if you need more than what I gave you on how they created the table and why they created it like that, it's on page 9. Everybody cool with that? All right. And then they say, okay, we have to start adding tasks to the database. All right. Hopefully you remember some of this stuff from last semester or whenever you took the class. What's that doing? That's attempting to connect to the database test using local host with a username of username and a password of password. Does all that make sense? So I had to go in and change all those. So that was root, and that was blank, and that said task DB. Does all that make sense? That's what we're supposed to be doing right there. All right, so let's take a look at the script here that's on page 11 and 12. All right, we make our connection to the database right here. All right, check to see if the form has been submitted. Remember, if the form's been submitted, that means you've got some kind of a button on it that's been clicked, right? And that button is the one that's over here that's someplace in here, wherever your form is set up. I don't know where they've got the form set up. All right? But it's someplace in there. I'm not worried about it right now. We'll find it. All right? Sanctify the input. What they're saying there is do, do input validation. So in English, what this says right there is make sure that the parent ID, if it's set, it's a number greater than or equal to 1. And if it's not set, set it equal to 0, which means it doesn't have a parent. Does that make sense? OK. All right. Then we're, we're, we're running the MySQL escape string, because remember, what we want to do in there is we're, we're sanitizing our input. So before it goes into the database, if it's got any ticks in it, back ticks or whatever, we're getting rid of all those. All right. Then here, we're attempting to insert it into the database. And here is where we're setting up the query. Here's where we're running the query. Since we're only allowed to put in one record at a time, this should return one if the record was added. And if the record couldn't be added for whatever reason, it should return the task could not be added. Does all that make sense? All right. And then here's our form. So that's, the, that's it right there. Action equals add task PHP. Well, that is this particular, this, that is this file, add task PHP. So notice that when you submit the form, 
it keeps you on the same form you're at so you can put you can enter multiple tasks one at a time but you can enter multiple tasks that's what we're going to do in a minute all right so this is just building our form right there and here this says retrieve all uncompleted tasks all right and we'll get into that in just a bit and what does that mean well uncompleted tasks are ones that aren't completed yet so isn't that everything that you completed that you didn't put a complete date on it yet? Yes. And show them all to us. Also, then, when you get done with this, we're going we're gonna to grab all the stuff that we got in here. So this right here is giving us all of our tasks. That's going to give us every task. All right? Then we're going to create a brand new array right here. Then what we're saying in this while loop is grab all those tasks that we just got up here and throw them into our array so you can show them to us. And then down at the bottom they're running those same sort functions that we just went over. All right. So if you say, okay, it sort of makes sense, can we see it in action? Yes, I'd like you all to right now, if you're not there, I had no problem today at all working with this and working with it in, uh, working with it in uh, Chrome. Sorry. So bring up a browser. Either bring up Firefox or bring up Chrome. I don't care which one. Bring up one or the other, please. And from your browser, type in HTTP colon slash slash localhost slash CH01 and hit enter. Of course, the page is not available. Why is? Oh, I, I'm not. I'm not on the virtual desktop. That's why. All right. Let me get to the virtual desktop. Now I'll put it in. Okay. So, HTTP colon slash slash localhost slash CH01. And you should get something that looks like this. All right. I'll give you a second to do that. <clears throat> Yes? We, we got that? First of all, if you look up here, this one you don't want to open up inside of, of here. The one that I've got the mouse on, the ch01.sql, you don't want to open that one up inside of here. It doesn't know how to open it up in XAMPP, so what it does is it basically treats it as though it treats it as though it's a zip file. Watch what happens when I click. See how it came down there? So it did open it, but it's, it doesn't know how to open it technically inside of XAMPP. All right? So the one that we care about now, you don't have to do any of these, but if you look up on the screen here, this sort is the one we already went over. There's the array as it was. There it is, sorted by name, John, Rob, Stephen, Stephen, Vance. There it is by grade in de descending, 98, 5, 94, 85, 1, 85, 1, and 76. All right, so we don't have to go over that one. Okay? If we look at sort 2, now they're starting to use that in here. All right. In fact, this is add task. So that's the one I want to open up right now. So I'd like you to open up add task, not add task two yet, add underscore task dot PHP. And you won't have the stuff in here that I have because you haven't added it yet. Does that make sense? I don't care what you put in. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna start doing something new here just so you can see it. All right. So what I'm gonna do here for my tasks, I'm gonna put in a new task. Uh, let's say let's see what's what what's something that we would want to maybe do multiple times all right yeah <laughs> eat bacon no Steve's not here anymore how about yeah I like that do homework we're gonna so do do homework and we will not give it a parent everybody with me I'm gonna say do homework without a parent and I'm gonna add the task now, notice where it put it right here. And you go, well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Because this is, it has no parent. This has no parent. This has no parent. All right. The ones that are here are all children of teach. If, if that confused you later, I'll get, I can go in there and get rid of them. In fact, I could if I wanted to. I could even come in here now and get rid of some of these if I want to. All right. So we've got do homework. So let's go add another task. And let's put in here do PHP homework, but don't hit enter when you get done. 
So do PHP homework. All right? And let's make that the parent will be do homework. I guess I got to spell homework correctly. That would be nice. So do PHP homework, and the parent will be do homework. So if yours looks like this, then click add task. Okay? So that's in there. And let's do one more. So we'll say do Android homework. And we'll make that parent also do homework. And then we'll add one last task, and we'll call that task go to sleep. And we'll have no parent. So we added do homework, do PHP homework, do Android homework, and go to sleep. All right? So I've got all those in there right now. Okay, now, just so you see this, if you look up on the screen here, what we'll eventually get to is this, okay? Notice there is an add task and a view tasks. Notice what the view task 2 does. I can say what I finished, so I'm going to say all this stuff that's in here is finished. All right, so boom, update. So there's my current to-do list. Does that make sense, what we just did? It's still in the database, but now it's got completed dates on it. How do I know that? Because now if I go in here and I say, show me the date completed from, the, from tasks, notice that other than those ones I just added, these have all been completed. The first one I did this morning at 8.20 and the other five I just did. Does all that make sense? So what we're doing is we're, we're, we're building a front end using PHP to front end into our database, which is on the back end. Does all that make sense? Be, now, a person using this, this is pretty ugly. What we just showed, it's not beautiful. It, you need some CSS, et cetera, but it's not bad. All right. And if you look in here, too, you can see my date completed. But also, please look, again, describe. You don't have to do this, but describe tasks. Whoops. And there's a parent ID. So select parent ID from tasks. So what does all that mean? That means that these four things that are in here, those four have no parent. Hopefully that makes sense. These three that are right here, all right, they really are the first ones that we created as we started to work our way down, we had three things in there. And these are going to be children of one of these. And if you say that still doesn't make sense, this is where you can start to see the hierarchy right there. And it's important that we have two IDs in here. So you can see that if it's zero, it means it doesn't have a parent. All right, And you can start to traverse your way up. You can do the same thing with yours. You can write these same queries. These aren't going to look, your numbers are going to be different because I would already added records. But what I'm trying to get across to you is, again, we're front ending into MySQL using PHP. We started doing some of that stuff at the end of last semester. We're going to continue doing it this semester. We're going to continue working with databases, with PHP, and then do some object-oriented PHP in a few weeks. Okay? Or even next week, maybe, starting already. All right? So as we look through here, as I jump back then into the book, we just went through this one. He explains everything that's happening in here. That's why I use this book. Again, if you think, if, if everybody in here writes down at the end of the semester, Ullman books bite, and the only thing worse than them are Miroc books, because they got this darn two-column format, hate it, hate it, hate it, please never use it, then I probably wouldn't. 
but what I find is by and large books like this that have a, a things in both sides of the page like this, people either tend to really love it or hate it. These aren't set up like Muroc. Muroc has got all text on the left hand side and then examples on the right page. But this is the same type of format. But what I like about what he does is he does something. He tells you, you know, it's, it's the old, did you ever hear that when you, we talk about public speaking? Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, tell them what you told them. Everybody heard that? You know, that's your intro, your, your, your body, and your summary. That's what he does. He tells you what he's going to do. He shows you the code, and then he shows you what he just did. And that's what I like, because more, more and more books today, they, even if they've got great examples, they don't give good explanations of what they've just done. And I hate that. All right, so he's explaining everything that's going on in here on page 13 and 14. And, and he gives you, again, some examples. Now, there's some good nuggets, for lack of better words, in here. So if you turn up all the way here to page 15 in the gray box that you can see up on the screen, he talks about type, type hinting function parameters. Huh? What this means right here, that, is this is letting the system know that whatever your input is, is an array. And if whatever you pass in here is not an array, don't go on. You understand what I mean by a type hint? It's letting the system know. Now, it says, as of this writing, and I think it's still this way, you, whatever you want to type hint like this has to be a data structure, like an array or a record or something like that or an object. But you can't, you can't say, for instance, int dollar sign input or double dollar sign. You can't do that because type hinting doesn't work for simple data types. And they'll talk about it more in a later chapter. All right, still going over it here. So let's talk about these advanced function definitions. Now, you look up on the, sc on the screen here for a minute, please. He talks about here docs. These, these are the articles for which I gave you those, uh, those, that you are, those URLs that are on that list. So here's some talk about here doc. So here doc looks a little goofy. The whole here doc literally starts right there and it ends right there. Right? And what that says, it says here, this is some PHP text. It is completely free. I can use double quotes and single quotes plus variables too, which will probably properly be converted to their values. You can even use an EOT as long as it's not alone on a line like this. So what they're saying is, if you've got a bunch of text that includes double quotes and you don't constantly want to be putting single quotes, and then a double quote or a double quote within a double quote or a backslash, you can use, this says, this is now, for lack of better words, treat it as that though it's a literal line of text. It'll still put it on multiple lines, but that'll, put, that'll say, oh, that's a single quote. Oh, and those are double quotes. Oh, that's got a dollar sign in front of it. Use, do the interpolation. So if dollar sign variables was equal to Jeff, that would say plus Jeff too. Do you understand what I'm saying? What's really nice about using this kind of syntax is you can end up writing crisper looking code. That's all. So if you have any more desire to read about it, that's why I gave you the URL here. And it wasn't enough to just have a here doc. They needed a now doc. So all, the only difference between the now, here doc and the now doc is the now doc basically is just designed for single quotes, not single quotes and double quotes like a here doc. All right. So I'm not going to say any more about here doc because they will talk about it in here a little bit. What's a recursive function? What is a recursive function? Yeah, but what does it mean? How does it happen over and over? You're right. How does it's calling itself? That's a recursive function. If you want to know more about recursive functions, whoops, not there. If you want to know more about recursive functions, you can go over to right here. This is that elated.com. No, it's not a thing about somebody's blemishes. PHP recursive functions, how to write them and why they're useful. And they, they explain why use it, what, how it's used, and they give you an example. 
All right, and they use the famous factorial example. I'm not going to go through it at all. A recursive function is a function that keeps calling itself. The good news about a recursive function is it write, you end up writing less code. The bad news is recursive programs tend to take longer because every time the function calls itself, it's got to take a copy of whatever it was working on, throw it on the stack, and keep track of it. Then if it calls itself again, it's got to do it again. So it makes your stack a little more unwieldy. So programs can run slower. The other important thing about recursion, you have to make it stop eventually. You, believe me, you don't want to go into a recursive, endless loop in a recursive function. All right. So that's recursive functions. I'm not going to go through it with you. All right. They have an example in here of how you can use recursion. I'm not going to go through that particular program. What is that one? That is uh, view tasks. All right. And I, I, I'll lie a little. I, I guess we'll go through it enough in that what we'll do here is I've got to go back. Oops. Yeah, I've got to go back to the virtual desktop and choose view tasks. There it is. Now, notice what you can't do in view tasks. You can't remove anything from there. Whereas view tasks 2, the one that we just looked at, you're now able to go in and it's interactive. You can remove stuff and put a task complete list in there. The idea, though, is with this one, they wrote this recursively. They called the loop. They wrote a loop that says, hey, as long as you got tasks, keep going through there and doing them. Okay? And that's you, everything they did in here using recursion could have been done without using recursion. It's kind of like some people love while loops and use them whenever they can. Some people hate while loops and use a for loop whenever they can. Anything you do with a while loop, you can typically do with a for and vice versa. Yeah, there are exceptions always, but you get the idea. And again, after he goes over it, he goes through it almost line by line and explains what's happening in there recursively. All right? And that's pages 20, 21, 22, 23. All right, which jumps us up to page 24. You may remember this term. You may not remember this term. A static variable in this language is a variable that retains its value throughout function calls. Again, if you want more on that, if you didn't like that explanation, There's some more stuff from BrainBell on static member variables. But if I create myself, I'll make the world's one of the world's smallest PHP programs right here. So if I come through here and do this, let me make this bigger. So if I come through here and do this, whoops. And I come through and create a variable. Okay? So I say dollar sign count equals zero. All right? And I've got some code in here. I don't care what it is. Okay? And I, so I do some stuff. Then at the end I do that. Okay? So I'm done. Is that right? Is that what I want to do? All right. But you, you get the idea, right? So if I call this function over and over again, every time I enter this function, it's going to break a brand new count, and it's going to initialize it to zero. Does that make sense? Even if in here, in several places in here, if I say dollar sign count plus plus, if I do it all over the place, every time it gets into this function, it creates a brand new variable. If I do this, then it initializes it the first time, but it keeps its value. So the next time I come in, if I've added one to it, now count is equal to one. Does that make sense? So if you need a value to retain it's, if you need a variable to retain its value throughout multiple calls, you make it static. There's more to static than that, but for now, that's what we're talking about. All right. And he shows you an example of working with static variables. This is the second sort one. All right. Static count equal one. 
So when he goes through there, again, then he adds 1 to it. I guess I should have showed that example. The only time that count is going to be equal to 1 is the first time that is called. That's it. Same thing with this one right here. And again, he goes through that and he explains this line by line. All right. Which jumps us into anonymous functions. Remember what an anonymous function is? Does anybody remember besides John and Mike? What's the difference between an anonymous function and a, and a non-anonymous function? What, does, what doesn't, oh, here's a hint, what doesn't an anonymous function have? Jeff is my, Jeff is my, Jeff is my, there you go, name. An anonymous function does not have a name. That's the key thing. You have anonymous functions in PHP, even though we didn't do them. You've got them in Java. You've got them in JavaScript. Usually in Java, and you may have heard this term before, they're called lambdas, L-A-M-B-D-A. -A. That's usually what they're called. All right. So do you need to use them? No. Sometimes they make for a little bit convenient code. Right here. Hopefully this makes sense to you. What are we doing right there? We're creating a variable called dollar sign hello. That should make sense to everybody. But then notice what we say. Function. What's the name of that function? There ain't one. So it's an anonymous function. That's the anonymous function because it just says function. It requires a parameter. And this is the body of the function. So now we can call hello and pass it world, and it'll print for us hello world. Now that example is stupid because you don't gain anything by doing that. But what you can gain, and they show this here on the side of page 27, related code. The function definition and its invocation are kept together. Second, PHP will only need to maintain the anonymous function's definitions while it's being directly used. So the idea is it can result in faster code. All right, your code can run faster. The downside, it's not checked as well. So when they say it can have parse errors, that means it's possible for something to get through into the function that wouldn't be able to get through to it if you wrote it the standard way. That's all. So again, if you say, I'm still confused, Jeff. OK. So imagine that I came in here and wrote this. Yeah. Yeah, we can still keep it pretty big. I'm going to call it function howdy. And I wrote in here echo. I don't even care about the, the paragraph tags. I'm going to say hello dollar sign who. You all should understand that. OK? So if we ran that then, and we wanted to create a variable, let's say, called Jeff, I could say dollar sign Jeff equals howdy, and I could pass in there dollar sign, uh, not even dollar sign, I could just say Jeff, right? Does that make sense? That would end up printing out, hello, Jeff. That all makes sense? But now notice what we have here. We created the variable, and we don't have the expense. Basically, the variable is right here. We're just assigning it every time we run the function. So now, I don't even have to create another variable down here. I can say hello. So doing it the second way, which I'd like to show you, but now we can just come in here and say dollar sign hello, and then just pass in Jeff. And remember, we actually, for, for, for this one, we could put in single quotes, which would actually have been better, here and here. There we can't put in single quotes unless we want it to say, hello, dollar sign, who, or if we want to use single quotes, we would do it like 
that and then get rid of that. That would work also. All right. So your code becomes a little crisper, for lack of better words. All right. And again, he does a great job, I think, on 27 and 28 of going over this. And then he shows you some here on 28. But the bottom line is, if you go, well, this is hard. Yeah. That's why they pay people to do it. All right. And sometimes you, you may be put into a situation where somebody says, hey, this isn't running fast, fast enough. You've got to find a way to speed it up. And sometimes using things like anonymous functions, things like that can be used to speed up how fast your code runs. Question? Yes, it should have. Thank you. Somebody's listening. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. In fact, there shouldn't have been a dollar sign there either. Here. And I'll get it right sooner or later. It's like the old joke. Yeah, don't, don't, don't worry about it when I edit it. Anybody happen to see this? I, I, I found this really funny. My daughter had to show it to me. I don't know if you saw this or not. I guess uh, a week or so ago, Jimmy Fallon had uh, Nicole Kidman on. I don't know if you heard about this. She actually had a date with him that he didn't know he was date. It was a date. Uh, some friend, somebody they had that was a friend of both of them, was out with Nicole Kidman, and she said, "I'd really like to meet this Jimmy Fallon." This was years ago, so he called Jimmy Fallon up and said, "Hey, Nicole Kidman's here. I'd like to bring her by." He's like, "Yeah, I'd like to meet her." She looked at it basically as being a date. It sounds like the guy, the friend, either didn't come or excused himself. All right, and according to her. He sat there the whole time and played video games. He had on sweats and a baseball hat. And she said, I wondered if you were gay. That's what she said. All right, so I'm not, I'm not trying to be politically incorrect here. All right, but the, the, the point is he didn't even know because she didn't tell him. All right, and a lot of times with you, you're going to be told by somebody, hey, the, hey, Travis, make this work faster. And you'll go, how? And they'll go, if I knew that, I wouldn't have asked you. You're going to have to run a bunch of tests on this and find out where the bottleneck is. So you're going to basically, you're going to almost reverse engineer the program. You should know when you start doing that, things like, like working with files and databases are going to slow the program down. So you want to be able to tweak your queries for your database, et cetera, and write them in such a way that you're not getting information you don't need. You're not doing things that you don't need. So this is just another tool in your arsenal or whatever you want to call that. All right, finally, for references, okay, and with that, you may or may not remember this, okay? Couple things. First of all, if I, if I do this, and I'll try to write this right, John, I, I have, honestly, I appreciate when people tell me that when I screw up. I really do. I mean, I may not think that, but I do. All right, if I come through there, through in here, and I've got a variable that's been defined outside of my function. So I'm at the top of my program. And I come through here and I say dollar sign age equal 21. All right? If I come through here and I say dollar sign age equals 64, 4, those aren't the same variable. Does everybody get that? It creates a new one. If I want to use that variable, then what I should do is this. That says age has already been defined outside of here. Use that one. All right? That's the first thing. All right? The second thing is anything that you pass that's not an object or an array, basically you're passing a copy of it. So if you change it, you're changing the copy. So how do you get around that? So in other words, okay, in other words, what I want to do here, all right, is I want to come in and I want to pass age in. Okay, so somewhere down here I want to call this. I want to call, uh, don't ask me why I would do it like this, but I want to call Howdy, and I want to pass in dollar sign age, and I want to change it. Does that make sense? So I don't want this here anymore. So I have to pass it with an ampersand. Kind of like we did in C, but there's no asterisk that you use like you didn't see. Now again, there's a little more to it. We're running out of time. That's explained right here in this particular one. There was the anonymous functions, so that's the one. All right. 
read this. It's important stuff. Here, Doc, we've already talked about, so I'm just skipping that. Now, Doc is in there. So, last thing, real quick printf and sprintf. Printf, this should all look familiar to you. In fact, when you look in here and you look at an example of using printf, there it is. That should look real familiar to you. All right. Why? Well, notice in here, dollar sign B. Percent B, that's going to be this. Percent C, that's going to be this. Percent D, that's going to be this. It's not 100% identical. Very similar to what we learned in C. Again, not identical, very similar. And I'm expecting that you can all go through and read this stuff. All right. All right. Bottom of page 38. As the author says here, Sprint F, or some people call it Sprint F, some call it S Print F. It says it works exactly like Print F, but instead of printing it, it returns it. This may be the most important part of today's lecture. By using Sprint F, you can end up writing something. It says change the line that defines the query to read this. And you'll have to read this yourselves, but the idea is if you write really complex queries, really complex queries in PHP, you'll have single quotes and double quotes, et cetera, and you'll have it all over the place. And it gets really, really ugly real fast. So by using things like Sprintf, think of what Printf does. Print something to the screen, right? Think of then what Sprintf does. It prints it, but it doesn't show it to you until you ask it. It's a placeholder. All right? And that's exactly what it's doing right here, and that's what they talk about in here. All right, I've kind of gone over the, the tasks functions. If you get a chance, take a look at them before next class, because that's it. Okay? I thought of making you do this stuff, but to me, it, 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 although they're good exercises, it's busy work. All right, and you're going to have enough to do this semester anyway. But we'll pick it up on Chapter 2 next class, Developing Web Apps. I'm still working on this, and I've got part of this done. But we're going to look at changing some of our initialization files when we go into this. Again, I don't know why he does this. He goes and he puts stuff in one folder. Then when he, when he puts it in his code, he gives it another name. And he does this throughout the book. He did it in all of his other books. I, I should just tell him, Larry, I'd like to co-author books with you and I'll take all your code that you screw up and I'll fix it. All right. So that's the plan. And hopefully we'll be able to do that and go through chapter two. I already showed you the schedule then for the rest of the semester. Okay, questions? You thought I wouldn't get done by eleven fifty. That's it.